Good afternoon. My name is David Lehman, and I will be moderating this debate. This afternoon we have uh, two distinguished debaters. For the side of Christianity, we have Sam Shimon, who was born in Kuwait. Sam moved with his family to the U.S. at the tender age of two. Sam's religious upbringing was based on the teachings found in most Assyrian homes, the Church of the East, most commonly known as the Nestorian Church. During his adolescent years, Sam was confronted and challenged with his Christian beliefs and introduced to the teachings of Islam as being the one true religion. This encounter shook Sam in a profound way, and God used his experience, this experience to cause Sam to dig deeply into the basics of the Christian faith. This examination came in the form of examining the teachings of the Holy Scriptures closely. While he examined the Scriptures, he came into contact with the person of Jesus Christ and accepted him as his personal Lord and Savior. Considered by scholars and theologians to be an authority on the teachings of Islam as well as Christianity, Mr. Shimon currently writes for one of the world's most highly recognized websites challenging the teachings of Islam, answeringislam.org. As a key staff writer and contributor to the website, Mr. Shimon has countless articles dealing with the common objections and obstacles presented by Islam against the Christian faith. In addition to his major contribution, the website, Mr. Shimon has engaged in debates nationwide as an informed apologist refuting the accusations and attacks presented by Islam against Christianity. Mr. Shimon also lectures and teaches across the country and is a regular guest speaker for many Christian leading missionary and Christian education organizations. Farhan Qureshi, speaking for Islam, is a former Ahmadiyya who converted to Islam at the age of 17 and since has been defending Islam. He can be found on defendingislam.com. He is attending now in his third year of medical school studying clinical psychology, psychiatry. He is engaged to a former Christian who now is also a Muslim. I would like to give you the format of the debate. We will start with two 25-minute opening statements and follow that with two 10-minute rebuttals, followed by two five-minute rebuttals, then a crossfire of four questions each, where they will have one minute to ask the question, two minutes to answer the question, and one minute to comment on that answer. This will be followed by a five-minute concluding statement. The first person to give their opening statement will be Sam. Yes. Sam Shimon. <clears throat> Sam? David, would you introduce the topic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. The topic is um, Trinity in the Old Testament. Sam Shimon. Savior Jesus Christ, I ask the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son, uh, to anoint my mouth to speak truth without error, to speak clearly, to speak accurately, and I pray in Jesus' name that he protects me from making mistakes and exegeting the passages of the Hebrew Scriptures and representing the objections of my opponent. And so I pray that it will be a blessing to those who are seeking the truth with an open heart as I seek to demonstrate from the Hebrew Scriptures. Remember the thesis tonight. The thesis, uh, thesis is Trinity in the Old Testament. So I won't be discussing what the New Testament teaches concerning God's multi-personality. Nor will I be discussing what the Quran teaches on that subject. I'm going to limit myself to the Hebrew Scriptures and demonstrate that the Hebrew Scriptures, the inspired prophets, recognize that although their God was one, He was complex in His being. <clears throat> in fact, to even say God is one is a meaningless statement. Because what do you mean when you say God is one? Do you mean He's one person? Do you mean He's one community? Do you mean He's one corporation? What do you mean when you say one? That has to be defined. Now Muslims are Unitarians. 
They assume that when we say, or when they say God is one, it has to mean in a Unitarian sense. And what do I mean by Unitarianism or Unitarian sense? That God is not just one in His being, in His existence, but He's also one in His person. Otherwise, it violates monotheism. I'm here to demonstrate that the Hebrew Scriptures do not agree with such an assertion and conception. Now, my time is limited, so I'm going to be scratching the surface, so bear with me. And I have a lot of reading to do, because I have to read from the primary source that we'll be using in the debate, the Hebrew Bible. But let's begin with the fact that according to the Hebrew Scriptures, Yahweh God is a father to His people. Now, let me define what I mean by father. We do not believe, nor do the Scriptures teach, that God is a physical being who has physical sex with a woman to procreate children. We do not believe that. When we speak of God's fatherhood, He's a spiritual being, so He's a spiritual father to His people. Now let me prove that assertion, because this concept of God is foreign to the Quran, to the Muslim position, and I'll demonstrate. In Isaiah, I'm sorry, Exodus 4, 22-23, this is what God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what Yahweh says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So here God says he's a father to his people. Not in a sexual, procreative sense. Deuteronomy 32.18. Deuteronomy 32.18. You deserted the rock who fathered you or begot you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Now this is quite interesting in light of the assertion of the Quran. That Allah neither begets nor is he begot. Lam yedet wa lam yudet. That statement in itself stands in opposition to the Hebrew Scriptures. So if my opponent tonight wants to say, we worship the God proclaimed in the Old Testament, then he's going to have to contend, contend with this contradiction. The Old Testament, the God of Israel, is a father to his people. He begets them spiritually. All of the Quran is a father to no one, especially to the Israelites, because in chapter 5 of the Quran, this is what we read, chapter 5, verse 18, Say to Jews and Christians, we are the sons of Allah and His beloved ones. Say, why then does He chastise you for your sins? No, you are mortals of His creating. So the Quran is quite clear. Allah is not a father to Israel. He's not a father to anyone. However, Yahweh is a father to His people and protects them and provides, to them, provides for them as a spiritual father. So the Old Testament agrees with Christian theology when it talks about the Father of God. Secondly, and I want my opponent to try to address this. He can do it in his opening statements or he can do it in his rebuttals. The Hebrew Scriptures have no problem with God appearing as a man without ceasing to be God. The Hebrew Scriptures have no problem with God appearing as a man without ceasing to be, to be God, and not just appearing as a man, eating food in that form without ceasing to be God. Now where does the Hebrew Bible say this? Genesis 18, the entire chapter. Again, because time is fleeting, I can't read all of it. Let me just read as much as I can because I have a lot of material to cover by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yahweh appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may all wash your feet. Three men who have feet that can be washed. And rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can refresh and then go on your way. Now that you've come to your servant. Very well. And then if you go on, it says, quick, he said, get three seals of fine flour, knead it, bake it, make some bread. He ran out to the herd, selected a choice calf, and gave it to a servant, and he prepared it. And then it says this, while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Continue reading the chapter. Yahweh has a conversation with Abraham concerning going down to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroying it. And then Abraham negotiates with Yahweh saying, will you destroy the entire city? What if there are 50 righteous in the city? And he says, for the sake of 50, I will spare it. And then at the very end, again I have to summarize because my time is leaving. At the very end it says, when Yahweh had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. There is no argument there is no way you can get around the fact that in Genesis 18, Yahweh is one of the three men appearing as a man, eating food without ceasing to be God. So I want my opponent to answer that objection. Does he agree that his God, Allah, like the God of the Old Testament, can appear as a man without ceasing to be God? That's the two objections I want him to address. Now let's 
talk about the Spirit of God. Now, in Islamic theology, we, we are told that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is Angel Gabriel. Now, if my opponent comes up and says, this is what he believes, I'm going to challenge him to prove from chapter and verse a single statement in the entire Quran where it says the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. You will not find it because the Quran doesn't teach it. That's later in Islamic theology. And if my opponent wants, we can set up a debate to discuss the issue. Does the Quran teach Unitarianism? I contend that it doesn't. Now with that said, let's see what the Hebrew Bible says about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Again, I'm going to base my evidence on the Old Testament. A little later, I'll be providing quotes from Jewish authorities, from the Talmud and various sources, which agree that the Spirit, although distinct from God, happens to be God. From Jewish sources, because I often hear from Muslims that say the Jews didn't believe in a trinity or that God was multi-personal. I'm here to refute that lie because I'm going to quote from Jewish sources that teach the contrary to what Muslims claim. Let's look at what the Old Testament says about the Spirit of God. According to the Hebrew Scriptures, the Spirit of God not only speaks, but He happens to be God. And again, I don't think I need to prove to Farhan tonight that the Spirit is a person. And by person I mean has emotions, intellect, and will. Not a physical person limited to time and space, because that's what he believes. So I won't spend much time in demonstrating from the Hebrew Scriptures that the Spirit has personhood. But I will demonstrate that He has all the essential attributes of God. 2 Samuel 23, 2-3, the prophet David, a Muslim say, happened to be a Muslim. 2 Samuel 23, 2-3, this is what it says. The Spirit of Yahweh spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. Did you catch it? The Spirit speaking is God speaking, according to the prophet David. In fact, what God does, the Holy Spirit does. Exodus chapter 63, verses 10 to 14. Exodus, I'm sorry, Isaiah 63, I apologize. Isaiah 63, verses 10 to 14. There, Isaiah is recounting the blessings and favor of God upon his people Israel. And he mentions the Exodus, where God sent Moses to deliver his people. In that context, here's what Isaiah says. He attributes the very functions of God to his Holy Spirit. Isaiah 63, 10 to 14. Yet they rebel and grieve his Holy Spirit. No, the Spirit can be grieved and can be rebelled against. As we continue, it says, Where is he who sent his Holy Spirit among them, who sent his glory arm of power to be at Moses' right? And then continuing to verse 4, it says, Like cattle that go down to the plain, they were given rest by the Spirit of Yahweh. Did you guys get it? The Spirit gave rest to the people of God. The Spirit was in the midst of the people of God, ensuring their deliverance. And the Spirit can be grieved and rebelled against. However, if we read Exodus 33, 14, Exodus 33, 14, Yahweh replied to Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So now who exactly gave the people rest? Yahweh or Spirit or both? Because Yahweh and the Spirit are one in essence, but distinct in person. Not only that, in Psalm 78, the psalmist again mentions the Exodus, and in that context, when he speaks of the Exodus, he actually says, let's look at what he says, how often they rebelled against God, Him, in the desert, and grieved Him in the, in the wasteland. That's Psalm 78, 40. And then verse 56, he says, but they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. So now who did they rebel against? God or Spirit? Who did they grieve? God and His Spirit. Well, to the Old Testament prophets, to grieve the Spirit is to grieve God, because although the Spirit is distinct from God, he happened to be a divine person. According to the Hebrew Scriptures, the Spirit creates, gives life, and regenerates. He creates, He gives life, and regenerates. This is again the Hebrew Scriptures. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. What in the world is the Spirit doing at that moment of creation? Why was He there? Well, again, if you read in the Hebrew Scriptures, He was there because God used the Spirit to create and give life. Now, where do we see that? Job 33, verse 4. Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So, according to Job, the Spirit made him. And then when we go to Psalm 104, verses 29 to 30. Psalm 104, 
Verses 29 to 30, we are told, When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their spirit, they die and return to dust. However, when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. Did you catch that? God sends the spirit and the dead come to life. God sends the spirit and he regenerates the earth. What kind of attributes must the spirit have in order to give life to the dead and regenerate the entire earth? The very attributes of divinity. Let's continue. According to the same Hebrew scriptures, the spirit has all the omni attributes of God. He's omniscient. Omnipresent and omnipotent. Before I go on, how much time do I have left? Let me know I'm doing my time. So far left. I got 11 more minutes? Yeah, 13. Okay, 13, good. Let me know when I'm getting down to 10, 15, 20. Because I don't want to spawn too much on one topic and miss the other one. This is vitally important because I have a lot. Okay, let's go. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Remember I said, the Hebrew scriptures said, the spirit has all the omni attributes of deity. Well, let's see. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in depths, you are there. So according to this passage, wherever you go, the spirit is. Is that what he believes about the spirit of Allah? The spirit of Allah is omnipresent? The spirit of Allah is omnipotent? The spirit of Allah is omniscient? If he does, then he's no longer a Unitarian. He's at least a Binitarian. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you, in all of them. What kind of attribute must the spirit have to be able to indwell an entire nation of people at the same time? He must be omnipresent. But for what purpose does God put His Spirit into all of them? For this purpose. And move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. According to this passage, God will place His Spirit into His people, an entire nation of people, to move them in His power to obey God. What kind of attribute must the Spirit have in order to move an entire group of people to carry out the will of God? He must be on it. Now again, there is more, but for the sake of time, I'm going to limit myself to one more passage. And I'm going to discuss a third character in the Hebrew Scriptures that's fully divine, distinct from Yahweh the Father and the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Yahweh says, O my people. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am Yahweh. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. How does God give life to those who are mortally dead? By His Spirit. Notice, all of them who are dead will come out from their graves and God will put His Spirit in all of them that they may live. Showing you that the Spirit is the agent of life and again, He must be omnipresent to indwell an entire group of dead people and bring them back to life spiritually and physically. So it's an argument, as far as the Hebrew Scriptures is concerned, the Spirit, although distinct from God, He's a person who's fully God. It's an argument. And I look forward to His objections to all this evidence. Now, with the time remaining, let's discuss another divine person in the Hebrew Scriptures. And again, if I have to in my rebuttal period, I'll be quoting Jewish sources to document that this is not simply a Christian spin or an interpretation. This was a view held by many Jews, not all. It really amuses me. Muslims say, well, the Jews didn't believe that. Which Jews? I have 10 more minutes. Which Jews are you talking about? Atheist Jews who don't believe in God? Messianic Jews who believe in the Old and New Testaments and are Trinitarians? Rabbinic Jews who reject Jesus as a false Messiah and mock His mother in the Talmud? Which Jews are you referring to when you make appeal to them? If these Jews are good enough to refute Christianity, they're good enough to refute Muhammad and the Quran. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. So don't be selective in your sources. Be honest when you quote. And again, let's see the evidence. It's not about appealing to authority. It's about appealing to the scriptures. I don't care what any Christian or Jew or Muslim or atheist says. Give me your proof from the scriptures. And this is what I'm seeking to do tonight by the grace of God. Let's talk about the angel of Yahweh. Now let me define my terms. If you go back and look at the Hebrew scriptures, if you look at a Hebrew lexicon, 
as well as the Greek New Testament, the word angel simply means messenger. I know in our minds when we think of an angel, we think of a spirit being with wings. That's not biblical. In fact, I challenge the Christians here who believe in the Bible, find one instance where you find an angel with wings. You never do. Angels as messengers of God appear as men, not men with wings. Now with that said, the Old Testament mentions a specific angel, who although a messenger from God, is not a creature. He happens to be God. God acknowledges that He's God. He claims to be God, and He's worshipped as God. And yet He's distinct from God. Where is the evidence? Let's begin in Genesis 16, 7 to 14. I have plenty of references on the angel, but for the sake of time, I'm going to have to cut it short, unfortunately. John 16, 7 to 14. It's interesting because here the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, who Muslims believe to be the ancestor of Muhammad. Okay, well, let's see what Hagar says about this angel. The angel of Yahweh found Hagar near a spring, Genesis 16, 7 to 14. In the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, son of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. The angel of Yahweh told her. If you read, it's the angel speaking. It's the angel speaking to her. However, let us see what he says about giving her children. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Did you catch what he said? I'm going to give you children too numerous to count. Who in the world does this angel think he is? God? Well, let's continue. What does the author and Hagar call him? When we go to verse 13, she gave this name to Yahweh who spoke to her. Those of you following with me know, the angel speaking is now identified as Yahweh speaking to her. And what did she call this angel? You are the God who sees me. She called this angel the God who sees. I want to know if my opponent agrees with Hagar, the ancestor of Muhammad. This angel is the Lord who can give children, give life, and fulfill his promise, who happens to be the God who saw her. Does he believe that? And I hope he doesn't appeal to agency. Well, he's an agent and he speaks on behalf of God. That won't wash. Be careful of that argument. When someone comes up to you and says, Oh, well, he's God's agent, therefore he can speak as God. Baloney. And here's why. Remember if you hear that argument, that's invalid, and it's not faithful to the text. Weren't the apostles the agents of Jesus Christ? Weren't they his agents? Didn't they proclaim the gospel in his name? Now, with that said, could Peter go around and say, I am the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for you. After all, I'm his agent. So I can claim to be him. That doesn't work. So don't buy that excuse of the agency. Yes, when the angel speaks, he's speaking the words of God. But the angel cannot call himself God, nor be called God, because he's not. Any more than Peter could say, I am Jesus Christ, simply because he was Christ's agent. That won't work. Let's look at a couple more references. How much time have? Oh, praise God, we can do miracles in six minutes. Genesis 31, 10 to 13. In breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up, and this is Jacob, by the way, and saw that the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, or spotted. Now note, Jacob identifies the speaker. He says, the angel of God said to me in the dream. So he knows it's the angel of God speaking to him. However, in verse 13, look what the angel says to Jacob. I am the God of Bethel, the house of God, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. The angel tells Jacob, I am the God of the house of God. That's like Gabriel saying, I am the God of Kaaba. Did Gabriel say that? No, he can't. Jacob also prayed to the angel. He prayed to him to bless his grandchildren. Genesis 48, verses 15 to 16. May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walk, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. Did you catch it? Jacob is praying to the angel and asking the angel to bless his grandchildren. Interestingly, in the context, he mentions God and the angel, but the verb bless is singular. May he bless. He doesn't use the plural, may they bless. Wait, Jacob, you just mentioned God and angel, two distinct entities. Why are you using the singular verb? Well, I believe he used it because Jacob was aware that although this angel was distinct from God, he was one with God in essence. Let's look at a couple more references. What does God say about this angel? Exodus 23, 20 to 23. See, I'm sending an angel ahead of, me, ahead of you to guard you with, uh, your way along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. 
Pay attention to this angel. Pay attention to him. And listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. Why? He will not forgive you your rebellion since my name is in him. What an amazing angel. God warns the people, don't mess with him because he won't forgive you. And you know why he can forgive you or refuse to? My name is in him. In biblical thinking, when someone refers to someone's name, they're speaking of the characteristics, the nature, and or authority of the person. By God saying that my name is in him, he's pretty much saying, he is what I am. Shares my nature and has my authority. Unfortunately, the Israelites did not listen, did not listen to God. They rebelled against the angel, and this is what the angel does. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Judges 2, 1 to 5. Then the angel of Yahweh went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And notice what he says. And I said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to your forefathers. I'm really confused. The angel says, he brought them out of Egypt. He brought them into the land that he swore to their forefathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. The angel says, it's my covenant. I made the oath to your forefathers. I brought you up out of the land and into Egypt. And yet you rebelled against me and he will not forgive them. And he goes and says that he won't fight their enemies. Who does this angel think he is? Who does God think this angel is? That he has his name. He can forgive sins. He does the works of God. He's called God and calls himself God. What an amazing angel. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. And by the way, I'm just scratching the surface. Literally, on this subject alone, I can spend hours. And then several more hours on the Holy Spirit. But this is the problem with debates, the time limits. Zechariah 3, verses 3 to 4. Let's see what the angel says to uh, Joshua. Zechariah 3, 3 to 4. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said, that's the angel speaking, to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, the angel speaking, See, I have taken away your sin. Who took away Zechariah's sin? The angel. But isn't that what God said the angel would do or refuse to do? Remember what God said to Moses? I'm sending an angel out of him. Be careful. Don't rebel against him. He won't forgive your rebellion for my name's in him. So this angel has the power to forgive or not. A divine function according to Micah 7, 18, 19. So don't tell me here that, oh, he's speaking the words of God. No, he's saying, I forgive your sin. And according to Micah 7, 18, 19, that is a divine function that only God carries out. No created being has the authority to say, I forgive your sins, when those sins are sins against God. It's one thing to forgive offenses against me. You committed sins against me, and I forgive you. It's another thing to pronounce forgiveness of sins committed against God when you're not God. And yet the angel can do that. What's my time for? One minute, praise the Lord. Psalm 34, 6-7. I have two more references, but let me go to Psalm 34, 6-7. This angel is omnipotent and omnipresent. All-powerful, all knowing, Or I should say, all-powerful, present everywhere. The poor man cried, and Yahweh heard him save him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Did you get Whoever fears God, the angel is with them to deliver them and protect them. What kind of attributes must this angel have in order to be with every true believer no matter where he or she is? He must be omnipresent and omnipotent. So again, let me summarize. Yahweh is a father. Yahweh can appear as a man without ceasing to be God. The spirit is distinct from God and yet he has all the attributes of God. The angel is a messenger of God who is not a creature but fully God in essence. Recognized by God himself to be God who can do what he does. My time is up. Lord bless you.
was actually first introduced to a Jewish people and was for the first time explicitly taught by a people. This definitely, according to all of our historical records, is accomplished sometime after the appearance of Jesus on whom be peace. And it was at this stage that this whole one God, three persons, was introduced to a people who affirmed their belief every morning by quantity in one God and in whose hearts was imprinted an illustration painted by the words of God that I am a jealous God, and in whose definition of monotheism was a notion that even graven images by themselves can be a violation of the true oneness of God. In other words, violating Jewish monotheism is not limited and to actual polytheism. Rather, there are other means of violation to it as well. And this concept in question is both a violation of Jewish monotheism, as it was understood for thousands of years, and it was an invention and an innovation in the eyes of the Jewish population at the time of its inception. Imagine what it would be like that after thousands of years of understanding who and what God is, now all of a sudden you have certain individuals expanding the definition of God by saying that he is three persons. Imagine if you, personally, were the first generation to have received this message. What would you honestly do? As an unbiased person, if you had a teaching with you that had been taught for, for as long as Jewish monotheism was taught, and something like the Trinity was introduced to you, you would probably deny it, deny the concept altogether. Especially when your scriptures warn you explicitly in Deuteronomy chapter 13. And if a prophet comes to you and predicts by dreams and appears among you, announces you miraculous signs or wonders, and if those signs and wonders of which he has spoken of takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods and worship them, then you must not listen to the words of that prophet. Now think about this. This individual is showing you miracles. Signs, wonders, is prophesizing events that will take place. He's fulfilling all of the attributes of a true prophet of God. But what? He says, come, let us worship other gods. Do not listen to that prophet. But put that prophet to death. The equivalent can be found throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew Tanakh. But the idea is, if an individual comes to you and tells you to worship any other god that you have not known, then not only do you deny the person, but you put him to death. Now Paul of Jesus was beheaded, and the New Testament of uh, Jesus was crucified to death. But the latter is not what is important. What is important is a very explicit and clear warning to the Jews to deny any other concept of God that you have already known, other than what you have already known. Another point in my rational analysis focuses on the idea that without the Trinity being introduced via the New Testament scriptures, could one somehow conclude the Trinity to be a description of the one true God? The idea here is that it's only because of the New Testament scriptures that the Trinity is taught as a doctrine by Christendom. Had the New Testament never existed, nor Christ Christendom ever come, in, come to be, we wouldn't have anyone trying to justify a belief in multiple persons within a singular God. The only reason Sam Kinoon is trying to justify a triune doctrine is because the New Testament religion requires him to. Otherwise, if we simply have the Hebrew Tanakh, no one would conclude that God is multiple persons, or three persons specifically, since we're talking about the Trinity. This proves ambiguity and the need to justify and interpret wildly to arrive at the conclusion Sam would be arriving at. And this is the very reason why no Jewish denomination in history from the very outset of Judaism has ever defined God the way Christians have defined Him. And what is interesting is that Muslims and uh, uh, Jews agree that God is a Unitarian God. But the bad apple is Christianity who defines a new concept of God. And in my research, I came about a, a quotation from a particular Christian apologist. His name was uh, Robert M. Jr. Bauman. 
He says in his book, and he's writing to the Trinitarian, he's writing to Jehovah's Witnesses, trying to prove to them that, that, uh, that God is a Trinity. But it, he admitted in his book, why should you believe in the Trinity? Uh, that all Trinitarians agree that the ideas about God expressed in the doctrine of Trinity are not found directly in the Old Testament. And Robert Bauman is the director of the Institute of Religious Research. He's an American evangelical theologian and Christian specializing in the study of apologetics. Mr. Bauman Jr. is an award-winning Christian author and has taught undergraduate and graduate courses in apologetics, biblical studies, and related subjects since 1992. And this man is admitting that while all that Trinitarians agree that the idea of the Trinity is not expressed in the Old Testament. When I was studying uh, the opinions of Jewish rabbis, I came across a lecture by Rabbi Singer. He is, uh, he, he is one of the predominant Jewish scholars who is answering Christian uh, concepts and, and you know, the Christian apologetics and Christian mi missionaries that are trying to convert them over to Christianity. And he asked a very interesting question. He said, tell me something. If God wanted to articulate in the Old Testament the idea there is only one God and no other, if God wanted to dispel the notion of a trinity as a concept and a doctrine that was antithetical to Judaism, what would you need to see in the Old Testament to convince you of that? What should God have put in there to convince you that there really is no trinity and really there is only a unity in God alone? What would you need to be convinced of that? Now, the, what I take from this is that this debate is not something where I'm trying to prove there is no trinity in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scripture. The onus is on Sam Shimon to do so. Now I come... How many minutes do I have? Now I come to some of the issues that Sam Shimon has brought up in his opening statement. Sam talked about the Father, he talked about the Spirit of God, he talked about an angel, he talked about various uh, incidents throughout the, throughout the Old Testament. But none of these, these incidents ever point to the fact that there are three, specific the number three individuals that make up a Godhead. This has never been alluded to by any scriptures in the Hebrew Tanakh that, that Sam has pointed. He simply painted to you that there is the Father, that there is the Spirit of God, that there's this angel doing numerous things. But the, but the question here is Trinity. Three in one. This has not been something that Sam Shimon has demonstrated at all from his opening statement. He didn't because there is no statement that defines God as three persons and as one being. If it, if it was, at least one single Jewish denomination historically would have believed it. But we find none. He talks about the different manifestations of God, that God manifested himself in numerous ways, be it through a man or an angel, in other ways as well. He manifested himself through a burning bush. He manifested himself through, through uh, the, the, the battle of donkey, in other ways as well. If you want to talk about these manifestations, especially the angel that you speak of, then why don't you become a oneness Pentecostal today? If you don't know what oneness Pentecostals are, they believe that all of these are manifestations of God and that God presented Himself through these very means. But there's no concept of Trinity here. They deny the concept of Trinity altogether. Are these manifestations of God? Sure, they say. But the Trinity, a three-in-one deity, a three-person, three distinct persons, one deity, no. One specific uh, issue he talks about is the Spirit of God. He, he focuses on the Spirit of God. According to his religion, God is a spirit. The Father is a spirit himself, and that he should be worshipped in spirit and in truth. How is the Spirit a distinct person from God? He says that I don't think I need to, to, to prove that, but I think he does. He needs to establish that the Spirit of God is a distinct person person from God, with, as he said, has different emotions, is a different personality, 
knows what God the Father knows not, because of course the Son doesn't know what the Father knows. These are making the three individuals very distinct from one another. But just by giving verses talking about the Spirit of God, God is the Spirit. These are different attributes of God. And there is a vital difference between attributes of God and persons, distinct persons. You know, in Genesis, when it talks about the force of God going over the earth, and going over the creation, that's the force, the force of God. That is an attribute of God. It is a description of God. It's not a different person. It is God. He talks about... Uh, how, what this has to do with the Trinity, I'm not sure. He talks about how Surah Al-Ikhlas says that God begets not nor is He begotten. It has nothing to do with the Trinity. That there is one, one being and three persons at all. But just because the Quran denies that God is the Father, what does this mean? I mean, it's erroneous to the topic, but I'll go ahead and answer it. It means that God is not the, does not have any biological offspring. You shall not take things literally. God is better than to have an actual literal biological son. It's not talking about any metaphorical or spiritual concepts. It's talking about the, what Jews and Christians are alluding, that God should ha actually have a biological son. Particularly, the Jews and Christians who say that Jesus and Ezra are the, son the literal sons of God. It's not talking about the general concepts of God. It's talking about uh, excuse me, the general concepts of sons of God. Rather, it's saying very specifically that these notions are wrong to, if you take them literally. I believe that I have spoken of, uh, I believe I have dealt with all the, the objections within, the, within the, the simple rhetoric that I give to, to demonstrate to you here today. If there's anything additional that I've missed, I will go over. Unfortunately, when I was typing on Word, half of it got deleted by a click. But I believe that I've covered it all, inshallah. What I could have done in time to do that, I could have It's obvious to me tonight that uh, Farhan is, uh, is not even in the debate uh, because most of the points he says don't even address what I have to say and those points that did actually distorted my position. I'm going to try to address the last point he mentioned and try to work my way backwards and refute them by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he says that the Quran is simply attacking uh, sonship in a biological sense, that the Jews and Christians are God's sons biologically. Wrong. I challenge him to quote chapter 5 verse 18, chapter 9 verse 30, to prove that assertion. Making an assertion is not a proof. In fact, the very passages refute him and show that not only is he willing to distort my statements, he's willing to pervert what the Quran says. No Jew or Christian has ever believed he's a biological son of God. So when the Jews and Christians say to Muhammad, we are the children of God, they did not mean that we are his physical children through sexual union with a consort. They meant it spiritually, and yet the Quran still rejects it. So that assertion is a blatant distortion of the Quran says. In fact, if you go to chapter 9, verse 30, nowhere does it say that the Christians are disbelievers for believing that Jesus is the biological son of God. It says they're disbelievers for believing he's the son of God, period. Historically, what did the Christians believe at the time of Muhammad? You're telling me that the Orthodox Church at the time of Muhammad was telling Muhammad, oh yeah, Jesus is the result of sexual union between God and Mary. I know in other passages of the Quran, the author thinks this is what Christians believe, but he's ignorant. This is why we reject the Quran. So please, don't distort what the Quran says. Quote it in context, because you're distorting all your sources and my words. Then you said, well, in order for me to show that the Holy Spirit is distinct from God, right, that he's a distinct person from God, or you said it actually, you said, I need to prove that the Spirit is distinct from God because God is a Spirit. Again, you distorted the New Testament. John 4, 24, as anyone who knows the Greek, if you read what the Greek says, their spirit means is that God is spirit by nature. It's not saying he's the Holy Spirit. But he wanted me to prove that the Spirit is distinct from God. Well, here, let's read Psalm 104, verses 39, I'm sorry, Psalm 104, verses 29 to 30. When you hide your face, they are terrified. 
When you take away their spirit, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, does he say, when I send myself? When you send your spirit, they are created. No, God sends someone, something or someone distinct from him. How much more clear can it get that the spirit is distinct from God because God is sending the spirit and yet the spirit communicates with God? Another example. Numbers 11. Read verses 16 to 17. Numbers 11. 16 to 17. And 24 to 29, God says, I'm going to come down in a cloud on the tenth of meeting. I'm going to take the spirit that's on you and place it on the 70 elders. Here again, the spirit is someone other than God who's empowering Moses and will also empower the 70. God didn't say, I'm coming down to take myself from you and place myself on the 70 elders. How much more clear can the Old Testament be that the Spirit is distinct from God, sent by God, empowering God's people, but at the same time, he does have a point. But the reason why he can't see it is because he's assuming Unitarianism. The Jews were monotheists. Who said otherwise? Did you ever hear me deny the Jews were monotheists? Of course they're monotheists. I'm a monotheist. They're not Unitarians. Stop assuming it. Prove your case. You're telling me no Jewish denomination believe in the Trinity. Well, no Jewish denomination believes that God would send an Ishmaelite prophet in the 7th, 7th century. No Jewish denomination believes Messiah will be born of a virgin except the Jewish denomination that are followers of Jesus. So your appeal to authority is fallacious. If you're going to appeal to them, I can use them to destroy the Quran and your belief in the prophet of Muhammad. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. Be consistent because you say you serve a God of truth that speak the truth and don't be selective. But since he wants quotes about the Holy Spirit, let me give him some Jewish quotes. He quoted Robert Bowman Jr., a man I respect. But is Robert Bowman Jr. a prophet? Is he inspired? Is he infallible? Is he on the level of Jesus and Paul? He's a human being, he has his own views. You're a Salafi Muslim. You believe Tawheed is broken down into three components. And yet there are other Muslims that say that's innovation. So I can quote your scholars to say you're innovating, you're distorting the Quran. Quoting to me, uh, Uninspired fallible humans proves what exactly? Deal with the passages. Stop trying to avoid them by saying, well, God's spirit is God, therefore, he can't be distinct from him. No, he's distinct from him, who happens to be God at the same time. The evidence was overwhelming. You have no response. I guess you're preparing for a different debate. Let me quote Michael Brown. Again, I don't want to appeal to authority, because again, appealing to authority proves absolutely nothing. However, Michael Brown is quoting Jewish sources, the Talmud. He's saying, Jews, Jews, what denomination? Well, whatever denomination produced the Talmud, they clearly believe the Spirit was distinct from God who happened to be God. Let me quote him. Dr. Michael Brown says, Interestingly, there are some references in the rabbinic literature to the Holy Spirit speaking, announcing, crying out, crying out rebuking, and even serving as a counsel for the defense. For example, he has a list of them, but I'll just quote one. The Talmud states that when the elders performed the rite of the red heifer, they did not have to say, and the blood shall forgive them, or be forgiven them. Instead, the Holy Spirit announces to them, wherever you do this, the, the blood shall be forgiven you. And he concludes, after giving a slew of references, I don't have time to read all of them, for the time limits. He says this, in all these citations, which can easily, easily be multiplied, there can be no question that we're dealing with a who, and not just a, a what, a personal dimension of God, and not just an impersonal power, contrary to his distortion of Genesis 1-2. He said in Genesis 1-2, that's the force of God. Wrong. Read the context. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Genesis 2-7. And then compare that to Job 33-4. In the context, the Spirit of God is personal. How do we know this? Because in Genesis 1-26, when God says, let us make man in our image, that was no plural of majesty. In fact, I'm going to challenge him again to quote the historical, archaeological evidence that he alluded to to demonstrate that at the time of Moses, at the time of the Israelite prophets, before Christ, they knew of the plural of majesty. And even the plural of majesty, if you look at any source, when it, when it defines the plural of majesty, it means someone speaking on behalf of a group, such as the divine council or royal court. So that explanation won't work. But when you look at the context, when God says, let us make man in our image, clearly He's speaking to the Spirit. How do I know? Well, I quoted Job 33, 4, which is another ancient Old Testament source. There He says, the Spirit of God has made you. Did you catch it? Let us make man in our image. Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit of God is there. 
Job 33, 4 brings it together and explains it. God was speaking to the Spirit who made man. So much for your interpretation, it's a force. That's not what the text says. Now again, let me deal with some other issues that he, uh, he mentioned. He goes, and so what God manifested in various ways? Why don't you be a oneness or a modalist? Did you ever hear me say that the angel is a manifestation of God? Did you ever hear me say that? See, he's attacking strong man because that's all he can do. He cannot refute the evidence. Anytime your opponent distorts, distorts your position, that's proof he's overwhelmed and has no counter rebuttal. I never said that the angel was a manifestation of God. I said the angel is a messenger from God, distinct from him who happens to be God. I am not a Unitarian, neither is the Old Testament. What's the proof that the angel is not simply a manifestation? I read the proof to him, but for some reason he ignored it. Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Exodus 23, 20 to 21. There God says, see, I'm sending an angel ahead of you. Did God say, I'm sending myself as an angel? I'm sending an angel ahead of you. And then he says, do not rebel against him, for my name is in him. How much more clear can the passage be? The angel's not simply a manifestation of God. He's a person distinct from God who happens to be God. Welcome to the world of the Trinity. I know it's upsetting for the Muslim to see this evidence from the Old Testament that clearly refutes your Unitarianism. And again, I'm going to set forth a challenge to my opponent tonight. He keeps talking about Unitarianism as being the teaching of all the prophets. I'm here to say it's not even the teaching of his prophet Muhammad. And I'm issuing the challenge, so let's debate. Does the Quran teach Unitarianism? It does not. That's a myth. A myth promoted by Muslims in order to deceive other Muslims that Islam is the purest monotheism there is. It is not. The Quran gives evidence of multiple persons and multiple gods and clear examples of idolatry. And I'm telling him, take me up on the challenge and refute me. He said something else. He referred to Rabbi Singer. My goodness, of anyone that you shouldn't be quoting, it shouldn't be Rabbi Singer. Do you know why? Rabbi Singer is a Jew who thinks that Jesus is a false messiah. He's a Jew who doesn't believe there's a single prophecy of Jesus in the Old Testament. Does he believe that? Does he believe Jesus is a false messiah? Does he believe there is no prophecy whatsoever concerning Jesus? If so, why is he a Muslim? Why is he not a Jew or an atheist and agnostic? Again, inconsistency. And inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. I hope he will not distort my position and accurately represent, him, re represent me. Because again, when you do so, it means you have no case. Bauman says, 
it, the Trinity is not. Sam Shamoon says that it is. Fine. But there's still if the fact that Christians are undecided on the notion altogether. Now, with reference to Jews being monotheists, I know that Christians don't uh, understand that Jews are monotheists, and understand that they themselves believe they are monotheistic as monotheistic can be. Whether their definition of monotheism is accurate, uh, is an accurate definition of monotheism, is up to, to the person to interpret and understand. But uh, what I was alluding to is not that they were just monotheists. Rather, they were unitarian monotheists from the very outset. Why do we? Why? Why can we? Why can we come to that conclusion? As I said in my opening statement, for thousands of years, Jews and prophets of God taught one another a definition of God. When they prayed to God, when they worshipped to God, when they went to the temples and asked God for things, they had a definition of God that they were praying to and worshipping. It is There is no evidence at all that they ever defined God as triune. That is an onus on you to, pr to prove, not for me to prove. Because automatically, if God is Echad, one, it means just that. Now, uh, Sam also talks about the, the, the issue of majesty. I was assuming that he would bring that up in his opening statement, but he brought, since he brought it up in the rebuttal, that's perfectly fine. Uh, with, with reference to that, Okay, first of all, us and we does not equal three. Because this debate is about the Trinity, us and we doesn't equal three. So, again, it doesn't prove the Trinity at all. Second of all, he says that God says that we created you and are everything. I'm not a Trinity, are you a Trinity? If, we, if God created us in our image and, that, and he's a Trinity, that would, therefore we would be a Trinity. I'm one person, I'm not schizophrenic. There are other places uh, in the Old Testament uh, where the Hebrew Tanakh where it says, you know, let us come down and so on and so forth. We'll find, we'll find statements like these in uh, the Quran also. It, it is a plural majesty and it can be proven that this was the case. As a matter of fact, there are numerous Christian scholars. Uh, G.J. Uh, went in, in his World Biblical Commentary. The NIV Bible on, on its seventh page. The Riri Study Bible, Charles Paul Bo, uh, Liberty uh, Anointed Study Bible. Uh, Jerry Falwell, all of these who are devout Trinitarians have written in their commentaries of the Bible that us is a plural majesty. Now, of course, Sam's going to say, well, they're not prophets of God either. Well, there are differences of opinion within Christianity then. That's for you guys to figure out. Now with the issue of manifestation, Sam never said that they were manifestations of God, but by definition they must be. If God is a metaphysical spiritual being and that Sam agrees that God is spiritual spirit in nature, then, that, then it must be that any time God manifests himself, by definition, would be it through the, the fire, be it through Balaam's donkey, be it through an angel, that those things cannot be literally God. I had a debate with uh, uh, Nabil Qureshi. Uh, just, just a month ago, do you worship the flesh or do you worship the spirit? Do you worship the 100% man or do you worship the 100% God? Do you worship the created, limited uh, God that was that was adopted from the doctrine of kenosis, according to Paul, the limited version of God, or do you worship the omniscient God that you profess to believe in? Sam continues to talk about how the Spirit was sent here and there and, and, and so on and so forth. If God is Spirit in nature, what makes it different? Is it simply semantics that God is saying that I am sending uh, 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 the Spirit unto you? Is it simply semantics? Or if we define God as Spirit, then what makes 
the, 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 the spirit in question different from God? What makes it a different person from the Father? Where is it explicitly stated as such? And this is what I emphasized in my opening statement, is ambiguity and implicity. If all you can provide is probability and, and possibly and, and things uh, that, that need to be interpreted then this, and, and for something as centric as your definition of God, then this isn't a theology worth believing in. Where are the unambiguous and explicit statements in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Tanakh that God is three persons but one being? It's as simple as that. Same meaning. 
You can have distinct persons manifesting in different ways and still be one in nature and personally distinct. So again, I, I would respect that he accurately represents my position. Then he says, biological assumption has nothing to do with the topic. Yes, it does. Remember when I said that the Quran condemns the fact that God or Allah has children. And he said, well, no, it's condemning biological procreation. Read the passages. It doesn't say that. The Jews and Christians were not saying to Muhammad, we are the biological, sexual, uh, procreated children of God. They believed it in a spiritual sense. He says it's irrelevant. No, it is, irre it is relevant. Why is it relevant? Because that means the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob isn't your God. Because the Old Testament God is a father to Israel. Your God isn't. How can you say that you Jew, the Jews and you, agree when here, when it comes to an essential concept of God, His fatherhood, the Quran rejects? So you're not worshipping the same God. It's two different gods. You have the true God of Abraham revealed in the Old and New Testaments, and Allah, whom you think is the God of Abraham, but isn't. And then he says, well, you know, I objected to him quoting Rabbi Singer, whereas in the debate that I had with him, I mentioned Mulana Muhammad Ali. If you heard my statements in context, I'm not objecting to appealing to someone, provided you prov uh, present evidence, proof. What is the proof from Rabbi Singer that the Bible teaches Unitarianism? Time up? Sorry, I have more to say, but praise be to God and all the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Meaning the word of the, uh, uh, the word of he mentioned the Quran. Notice that I didn't object once to the word Trinity not being in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Maybe he's used to that from, from other Muslims, but I didn't object to that. The idea, if you're talking about ambiguity, he brought up a verse of the Quran that I know very well, is that it should be described at least explicitly. Now, the verse of the Quran that he mentioned is chapter 3, verse 9. He didn't quote all of it. In it, there are verses that are what the Shah susceptible to interpretation, and there are verses that are muhkamat, decisive in meaning. And whatever verses are susceptible to interpretation, uh, God knows the, the, the meaning of those. What God is telling us to do is focus on the decisive verses. What can be, that doesn't need to be interpreted. And what are things that shouldn't need to be interpreted? The definition of who and what God is. First and foremost, a theology is based on one's definition of who and what God is. And if there is ambiguity and implicity with reference to that, as there is in Christianity, and in this case particularly with reference to the Trinity being in the Old Testament, it is a theology not worth believing in at all. And this is what the Quran is actually saying. Go to the decisive verses. Go to what doesn't need to be interpreted. And one thing that does not need to be interpreted from the Qur'an is that there is one God. And Sam wants to challenge me on that. He can challenge me, but the issue, that is erroneous of the issue that we're dealing with. What we're dealing with right now is where is the Trinity in the Old Testament? We can talk about those other topics some other time. Again, whether God has a son or not is again irrelevant to the point whether tri the, a, a description of the Trinity, a three-in-one deity, three-person in one deity exists in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter if God has a son or not. If you want to debate Islam in the Quran, you can do that, do that on, 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 at another time. Whether, whether God actually has sons or but what, what the Surah al class means. We can have that debate, but that's not what this debate is about. It's about you proving to us and to the Jews, and to the Muslims, and to the atheists, and everybody else, that according to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Tanakh, unambiguously, explicitly, there is a trinity. And unfortunately, Sam, you have gone and, and, and described different aspects of God, that there's a spirit of God, that there's, that there's uh, the, the Father, and so on and so forth, but you have not provided evidences that these three persons are one deity. Why? Because it's not there.
Now, with re reference to Rabbi Zinger, I again emphasize that I don't care who asked the question. I, I wanted to give credit to the person who asked the question. I didn't want to ask the question and plagiarize this question. I don't care who asked it. The, the question still remains. What evidence do you need from the Old Testament to prove that God is not a trinity, but is a unity? That was Rabbi Singer's question. I think is a legitimate question. I don't care who asked the question. Now, with reference to the issue of, of God being a, a, a spirit by nature and then that the spirit of God is set and so on and so forth, this is an issue of interpretations. This is an, into, an issue of interpretations that any individual, be it Christians, Muslims, Jews, or others, can dive into the Old Testament and interpret according to their theology and their perspectives what this means. And Jews have given their interpretations and matches with the Muslims, and Sam's giving his interpretation. All it is going to be is a battle of interpretation. He's going to say that, that the Spirit of God is a separate person. I'm going to say it's not. What evidence do you have to say that this is a different person other than semantics? Now, my issue is this. Erroneous of what has been said here. Is there any explicit or unambiguous statement that God is a, a three persons as one being? Sam admits that there is not. And if this, the issue here is again that this is the definition of God we're dealing with. We're not dealing with possible doctrines and interpretations of, of any concept except the very definition of who and what God is. That's not my question. I want to know if you said that. Okay, so say it again. I God heard you Jesus. say up here that uh, God doesn't need to be defined in response to the fact that I was bringing up ambiguous, implicit testimony to the Trinity. And that doesn't suffice for you because when you speak of God, the language has to be explicit. So I understood your point correctly? The language has to be clear. Yeah, right? So that you don't need to define God. It will be clear. Yeah, it should be automatically clear without needing any interpretation. So I, I, I got my Right. I understand you're from a Salafi background, and uh, could you tell me, without defining, because you're not defined, well, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, I thought you were a Salafi, whatever, you're not. If you're not, it's irrelevant, because I understand there are divisions. Okay, now the Quran often speaks of, of the face of Allah, the shin of Allah, the hands of Allah, Allah descends, and I know that the Muslims are debating amongst each other. Now, can you tell me what that means? And, well, well anyway, sure, absolutely. And, but right. prove your position, don't just assume. Give me some evidence. Okay, absolutely. This has been debated amongst Muslims, um, whether God has actually hands or not, whether it's metaphorical or not. The primary two uh, perspectives are the Salafi perspective and the Sufi perspective. Uh, the Salafi believes uh, that when the Quran says certain things, it means it, and uh, it, but it doesn't mean, according to what the scholars I, I have learned under, that God has literal hands. Rather, it, He has hands, but they're just not like our hands. The Sufi perspective is that they're metaphorical. To me, it's pretty much saying the same thing. That, that God is describing Himself with different attributes and different descriptions. And uh, whether you take it metaphorically or literally is pretty much up to you. Response? Notice uh, that he had said that uh, when he's speaking of God, it needs to be explicit. It doesn't need to be defined. That's actually what he did say. 
And yet here we have a division of Muslims concerning the face, the hands, the shin uh, of Allah. There's a group of Muslims that say they're metaphorical, others that say it's literal. Yet he said it's unlike anything in creation, but that's not saying anything. So no, he had to define his God for me. He had to tell me what it means and what it doesn't mean. So by his own criteria, his definition of God can't be true because it required an explanation. So you're being inconsistent again. I can't respond to that. That's the question. Oh, so if I can respond back. You ask him. Right. I understand. We'll, we'll deal, with, deal with it in conclusion, inshallah. Okay. So if in the Old Testament God has so many times and explicitly declared himself to be the God of Israel, the God of, the, the God of Moses, the God, God of Abraham, and so on and so forth. If God has explicitly defined himself as such, then why cannot God simply in the, the same exact manner, simply and unambiguously say that he is three persons, uh, one being? It oh. doesn't, let me finish my question. The, 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 owner, the issue isn't what, with the Qur'an. If you want to talk about the Qur'an, it's a different debate. If you want to talk, go ahead. Oh, you want to answer? Go ahead. Uh, I don't know why did God didn't come on and say it. Uh, it's like asking, why did God just come on and say I'm one being and one person? You know, in fact, I don't want you to use the word monotheism. I want you to start calling yourselves Unitarians. See, when you use that argument, it can be used more forcibly against you. See, again, so God doesn't say I'm one being in three persons, therefore it's ambiguous. But the same token, God doesn't say I'm one being in one person, therefore that's ambiguous, therefore we're back to square one. So then how do we determine the case? By looking at the evidence. Instead of putting God in a box and asking God to speak a certain way, let God speak freely and then let us look at that revelation of God to see in what way does God define His oneness. Is it a Unitarian conception or is it a plurality of divine persons that exist as one being? And again, I don't think you object to the use of, let's say, post-biblical language because you use terms not found in the Quran as long as those terms are faithful to what the Bible teaches. So although the Bible may not use being in distinction to person, these terms are faithful to the witness of Scripture. But again, I'm going to ask you to be consistent. Because I can turn that against you and say, show me in the Bible, since you don't want to go to the Quran, and I accept your challenge to debate the Quran. Show me the Bible where God says, hey Moses, I'm one being, one person. Because you know, I, I, I know all things, and I know those darn Trinitarians will be coming, in the future, they're going to be perverting my words. So Moses, let me ensure those Trinitarians don't get away with it. Right. One being, one person. See, that argument is nonsense, and it proves absolutely nothing. Your question. Your question. I asked you. I have a good answer. Oh, I have one. Oh, I have one. Right, I do. I don't mind. I'll take your one. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I think the issue with ambiguity is in looking for specific words. That, that God needed to say that I am... Uh, uh, one person, three beings, or one person as uh, uh, indefinitely. What I think ambiguity means in my argument is that there should be a description of some sort, not specific words, but a description of some sort that one can, without any need of any interpretation or argument, say, ah, right there. It's very simple. There's one God and he's three persons. It doesn't need to be those specific words. Here, uh, I'm going to have to read the passage from okay? Is that alright? Okay, because we're arguing about the Jewish conception, obviously. Okay. Um, I don't, you don't have a Bible with you, so that's why I want to read it. Unless okay. you have a Bible online, I don't know. This is again Daniel. This is a Jewish scripture, so you can't say it's Christian. Mm -hmm. you know, unless Christians were there corrupting the scriptures when Daniel's around. <laughs> uh, Daniel 7, 9 and 10. I beheld to the thrones, and I watched the people hear the language. If I could just read the passages. Thrones, plural, were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of the head like the pure wool. His throne, singular, although there are many thrones, he only takes one. So I want you to pay attention to the text. It was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Okay, so it says, Ancient of Days sits on a throne, although there were thrones set up. Now, 13 and 14, same, same chapter. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him here before him. So he's not the Ancient of Days. Notice, the Son of Man is being brought to the Ancient of Days. So they're distinct. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, serve him, the same Aramaic word used for worshiping God in Daniel 7, 27. You can check that out to see I'm not making this up. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom 
that uh, which shall not be destroyed. But I didn't ask the question. I need to do this. Good idea. I'm sorry. That's why I said it. I just want to read the verses. Okay, that's fine. Here's an Old Testament text. Mm -hmm. You have the ancient of days one one throne, and the Son of Man was given eternal dominion. His dominion will never be destroyed. And it says, everyone, not some, will serve him. The same Aramaic word used in Daniel 7 27 for serving the most high. The most high. Can you explain to me how is this how is this compatible with the monotheism that you say the Jews uphold? Because you said Jews and Muslims agree. They're monotheists, we agree on that. So that, in other words, they're monotheists in the same way that you are. Can you explain how does this fit in your Islamic theology? Someone distinct from God, reigning forever, and being worshipped by all creatures. Could you explain how does that comport with your Islamic theology, this Old Testament text? Okay. Uh, I'll, what I was initially going to say, I'll say in my conclusion. Uh, but with reference to that, I mean, I don't see any description the, the, at least the ones that I would require and ask for of, of three persons and somehow that this person is, these three persons are one being. I mean, you're talking about some ancient of days and the Son of Man being blessed for serving God, but I don't see how this contradicts Jewish Unitarianism or Muslim Unitarianism. Uh, well, I think we can see it clearly. You have two distinct persons, both of whom rule forever, both of whom are worshipped by every creature, and yet you're telling me the Jews are still Unitarians. Doesn't make sense to me. Ancient of days, distinct from the Son of Man. Both of them rule forever. Both of them have thrones they sit on. And both of them receive the same worship from every creature, and yet this is still Unitarianism. In other words, your position is, I made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. What, that was my That was my response. That was my question. Okay, so I, this is my last question. Right. We, have, we have four each, right? This was my second, this is his second. This is my second. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and repeat. I'm going to go ahead and repeat the question. Uh, erroneous who, who asked the question. What evidence do you need uh, from the from the Hebrew Tanakh uh, that that there is not a Trinity but there's a Unity? Well, I'll tell you what evidence. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. My, my. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just like zoning. <laughs> I was thinking of the ancient of days. <laughs> All right. All right, let me come back. You're not going to take time off of that experience again. I have the attitude and vision. <laughs> right, let me come back. Uh, what evidence would I require? Well, the evidence I'd require is not to find in the Old Testament passages such as the Son of Man. Son of Man, who's obviously a divine being, who appears in human form, because one like the Son of Man means someone who appears as a man, who receives exact worship that God receives forever. Now, that's the kind of evidence I don't expect to find in the Old Testament if the prophets were Unitarians. I also don't expect to find the Holy Spirit being sent by God and accomplishing divine functions, such as creating, regenerating, sustaining, right, uh, saving, redeeming, and also being a speaking a being that he speaks and has emotions. So I don't expect to find that in the Old Testament if the prophets were Unitarians. And by the way, for the record, Rabbi Singer himself says the Holy Spirit is God. But like him, he thinks that it's the Spirit is not personally distinct, which is contrary to the Old Testament unless you believe God was sending himself, I wouldn't expect to find the angel of Yahweh being called God by Hagar. I wouldn't expect to find Jacob praying to the angel to bless his children. I wouldn't expect to find the angel calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wouldn't expect to find Yahweh saying, my name is in him, and he can forgive sins. I wouldn't expect, him to, uh, expect to find the angel telling Israel, I brought you up out of the land. Uh, and I brought you into the land I swore to your fathers, and I swore I would break my covenant with you. I wouldn't expect to find the parents of Samson saying when they saw the angel of God, they knew it was the angel of God, and then Manoah says, we will die for we have seen God. I wouldn't expect to find those kind of statements in the Old Testament. If Singer is right, the prophets were Unitarians. They're not, and he's wrong. Uh, since there's only one minute, I will indicate my conclusion when I'm responding to what Samson I ask Since you were appealing to authorities, and as I said, that would be the fallacy of authority unless you have some evidence to back up an authority. Let me quote to you a source. This comes from Jewish scholar Jacob Neusner. He's not a Christian, not a Trinitarian, unless he's a closet Christian being paid by Trinitarians to say this to refute those opposed to Trinity. Crying minds, one another. But anyway, let me read what he says in the Mishnah and Messiah. 
We focus upon how the system laid out in the mission that takes up and disposes of those critical issues of te teleology worked out through messianic eschatology, the end time when Messiah comes. Now, these earlier systems resorted to the myth of the Messiah as savior and redeemer of Israel, a supernatural figure engaged in political historical task as king of the Jews, even a God-man. According to this Jewish scholar, there were certain Jewish denominations, to use your words, that believed the Messiah was a god -man. Why do you reject them and why are they wrong? I mean, I have no idea what he meant by that. I would need to read it. I would need to read it in context to, to decipher. Now I would need to verify with uh, with either himself or other rabbis what he meant. Whether he's speaking in metaphorical terms or, or spiritual terms. I know I do know that rabbis do have an interpretation for what is meant for uh, mighty God in, in, in the Hebrew Tanakh, and uh, they have given according to what the lectures that I've listened to uh, a metaphorical definition of what that was meant, and where Elohim, what or Elohim was used throughout the New Testament. Talk, to talk about false gods, to talk about Moses being a god, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Um, my turn is fine. If you want the source, I'll give it to you. It's in my articles on the website. Judaisms and their messiahs at the turn of the Christian era. So he's talking about the Jew, various branches of Judaism around the time of Christ. It's edited by Jacob Neusner, uh, William Scott, and uh, Green and Ernest uh, as Flights, page 275. So it's there. Uh, you said that You'd have to look into the quote to see because the Jews interpret passages metaphorically. The Jews you're referring to, as far as Isaiah 9 6 is concerned, are Jews who, in reaction to Christians using these passages, had to explain such passages away. Isaiah 9 6, when the child is called the mighty God, it is no more metaphorical than when Isaiah calls Yahweh the mighty God in the very exact, uh, next chapter in Isaiah 10 20, 21. If it's metaphorical here, consistency demands it's metaphorical there. But we Christians accept it for what it says, and this is why we're Trinitarians. Uh, my next question is, do you have any archaeological or historical evidence uh, that the that Jews from any generation, from, from the very outset, before Jesus ever appeared, that they defined God or believed in God or worship God as a triune being? Uh, well, the evidence I gave is the Old Testament. Is that not proof enough? It's a historical document. It's the oldest document that we have uh, from the Jews, and clearly from Genesis all the way to Malachi. I didn't even give you uh, dozens of other verses to establish the uh, thesis that these Jews read the scriptures and they could clearly see the spirit is this thing from God. I even quoted sources. I quoted the Talmud. I just quoted uh, Neusner. I can also quote John J. Collins on uh, his exegesis of Four Ezra and First Enoch. Four Ezra and First Enoch were books believed to be written right around the time of Christ. Some may even say maybe a little earlier. But they look at these sources and they can tell that the Jews reading the Old Testament were not Unitarians. In fact, this is what's ironic. Muslims often like to use Philo, the Jew, Alexander the Jew, to prove that John was influenced by Philo. Who's Philo? Well, he was a Jew who lived before the time of Christ, who believed that the Word of God was distinct from God, and was God in essence, and he was the high priest, the chief of angels, the intercessor. So here's a Jew, long before Paul, who introduced the Trinitarianism, according to the statements he made, saying that in heaven there's someone distinct from God called the Logos, the Word. He is God, he calls him a second God, but in his theology, second God doesn't mean two gods. Read him, you'll see. That's the theology he uses to affirm that the Logos is distinct from God, and yet fully divine. And even says he's not created, and he's not uncreated. It sure sounds like the church fathers when it says that Jesus is eternally begotten. So here he can see from the scriptures that there's some other divine being who's in heaven sitting on the throne long before Jesus, and yet when that is quoted, you say, aha, John plagiarized Philo. So in other words, you know, damn if we do, damn if we don't. If we show that John is faithful to the Jews before him, he plagiarized. But then again, if you're asking me to show you sources to demonstrate that the witness of the New Testament is faithful with what the, some of the Jews believe in the Old Testament, I gave you five. I can give you the wisdom of Sirach. I can give you various sources. First Enoch, for Ezra, and the Old Testament. If that's not good enough, then nothing will suffice. Now, I know that there's various uh, interpretations. Was the Messiah God? Was this person God? And so on and so forth. These, these issues can always arise, but... I'm not asking about whether the Messiah would be God, or whether there's different aspects to God, or, or if God can manifest himself uh, in, in different manners. 
Well, what I was asking specifically is again whether there were uh, there is a description in the Talmud and the, and, and, and there's, there's any archaeological or historical evidence that any Jewish denomination or people define God, worship God, and pray to God as three persons as one being. Not whether this person or that person would be God or manifest, or if God could manifest himself as a man and so on and so forth. That's not the question. It's specifically about the topic at hand today, which is the Trinity, three and one. My final question, you asked the final question. Um, since you, you're saying that the evidence I gave from the Old Testament was implicit, and I deny that assertion, I think it's quite explicit. It was also explicit to these Jews who I quoted, they could see clearly that the Spirit was distinct from God, and yet happened to be God. The angel was distinct from God, and yet he was fully divine. Be that as it may, uh, as a Muslim, I want to know, are you comfortable with Jacob praying to the angel in Genesis 48, verses 15 to 16? Here's an angel, Jacob prays to him, and you believe he's a Muslim. Are you comfortable with the fact that Jacob prayed to this angel? And at the same time, are you comfortable with the fact, as a Muslim, and you can say with a clear face, because it's being recorded, oh yeah, that comports with Unitarianism. It comports with Islamic monotheism. The fact that the same angel tells Jacob, I am the God of the house of God, that's equivalent to Gabriel saying, I am the God of the Kaaba. Are you comfortable with those statements? Statements where the angel is worshipped, he's prayed to. Genesis 48, 15, 16. You kept saying, well, you know, we don't find any evidence that they worship three persons of God. Well, in Genesis 48, 15 to 16, Jacob is praying to the angel and asking him specifically to bless his grandchildren. Another place, the angel says he's God and he forgives sins. Are you comfortable with these statements as a Unitarian? Is there any possibility that I can actually verbatim read the verb first before I answer? Oh, my gosh. Go ahead. I think it is. There was there's no response to that. Just over time to another question. What do you mean there's no? That was, that was my question. There was no response to his answer. No, that was my question. No, no, no. That was my question. That was my question. Okay, let me, can I read it for him? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. All right, I got it back. Let's go here. Sorry, I just got to get back. I apologize. Yeah. Oops. Right here. Okay, 48. The context is Jacob's about to bless his grandchildren. Let's read it. And then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head. Guiding his hands with, uh, wittingly for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph, blessed him, and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, may he bless the lads. As I noted in my uh, rebuttals, the verb bless is singular, although he mentions God and the angel, and it's clearly a prayer to God to bless them. Are you comfortable with Jacob praying to the angel to bless his grandchildren? And how does that comport with Islamic Unitarianism? We Muslims believe that angels are blessings, and angels are sent down to humanity as blessings, and that they provide spiritual, uh, they, they provide a spiritual uplifting and, and, and help the person become more spiritually inclined toward God. Uh, I don't see that the person is uh, actually invoking the angel to provide him with anything particularly. But uh, since I am not a scholar of the Old Testament, as I said in my opening statement, uh, I reserve the right to go study the verse. And, uh, maybe no one asks where I'm not saying. Okay, give me his number so I can talk to him too. Uh, in Genesis 48, he says that he has no problem and he has to study the Bible. Fine, I would like you to study it by the grace of Jesus. Open your heart to the truth. Uh, but in the context there, he's praying to God. He goes, God, clearly no one would argue he's praying. God, the God, and yet he mentions the angel. You said that pretty much, well, it, it's not problematic. So then that means you could stand before the Muslims here and cry out to Jibreel. O oh, Jibreel, bless my family. O oh, Jibreel, save me from my enemies. O oh, Jibreel, may Jibreel bless you. May Jibreel protect you. You're saying you're okay with that. And yet you said you're a Unitarian. These are the final one. Uh, I just one question. Final question. Okay, would you say that asking a person to pray for you or asking uh, an angel to pray for you, being that, 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 that the angel is a medium, and this is something that Gabriel was, he was a medium uh, from, from, from prophets of God to other individuals. And asking the, the, the angel to go back to God 
to bless him with something, being that the angel is closer to God than, than that person initially may be, is that something that you would uh, consider uh, still a law in violation of Unitarianism? Uh, of course I would, because it's one thing for me to ask you on earth to pray for me. It's another thing to direct my prayers to heaven to someone besides God. The angel wasn't there. Jacob was directing his prayers to someone in heaven. And yet we know, both you and I know, that when we speak of the worship of God, especially you who holds to Tawheed and Tawheed or Ibadah, especially you, you know this, that when you're directing your dua, your, your invocations or prayers to anyone in heaven, it has to be to Allah alone. You can't say, oh Allah and Jibreel. Unless, again, you're a Sufi and you're embracing to you know, Tawassal, and you say it's okay to pray at graves and pray to Muhammad, which would be a violation of monotheism, and I'm sure you'd agree with that. So yes, it is a violation of Unitarianism. Uh, here, Jacob is praying to someone besides God in heaven to bless the lads, when the function of blessing is God, and Jacob has no problem. Why doesn't he have a problem? Because he knows the angel is not a creature. He knows the angel is God. And he wasn't a Unitarian. That's the point. No, I would agree to that. I'm pretty much open to interpretation. I do follow this. I'll let you are correct. But I am open to inter Muslim interpretations. I, I, I accept the differences of opinion. And I believe that in the Muslim community, that, and not just Muslim community, according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, that differences of opinion are allowed. In fact, I, I went over this in your, in your in our previous debate as well. I'm open to all interpretations, but I do have a set of thought, and I'll give you the credit. Why find the Muslim statement? And then we'll ask that for the five minutes QA, or we're done? You guys can hear me, right? But again, I just want to praise the God and Father of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not qualified to be representing Christianity, but by His grace and His mercy, He enables me to do so, and I praise Him for that. Nor am I worthy to represent my God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in His grace and mercy, He is pleased to use me, and I praise the eternal Son for that. But let me just summarize the evidence, and I think the evidence is quite explicit and clear uh, contrary to the assertion of my opponent tonight, and again, when I say my opponent, I don't say this derogatorily. I, I happen to have a lot of love and respect for Farhan. I think he's one of the best Muslim apologists and a credit to Islam. He represents Islam with respect and dignity, and I pray that all of us do that, no matter what religion. So I thank him for his decorum. Uh, to summarize the evidence, to summarize the data tonight, we looked at the Hebrew Scriptures, and I limited my discussion to evidence from the Old Testament. Didn't use the New Testament. Uh, if Quran wants, in the future we can debate whether the New Testament teaches the Trinity. Right? So I limited my, my discussion in the Old Testament and we discovered that Yahweh God is a father to his people. Now why is that important? Because earlier we were saying, well, it's not relevant to the Trinity. You're right. It's not really relevant to the Trinity because it doesn't prove the Trinity. However, it's relevant to the discussion whether the prophets were Unitarians who believed in Islamic monotheism. Not just Unitarians, but embraced Islamic monotheism. Because you're going to hear Farhan in his debates. He did it with Farhan Qureshi. I'm pretty certain he'll do it in the future. Where he says, well, the Old Testament prophets taught the same concept that Muhammad did. God is one. No, they didn't. The God of the prophets was a father to his people. The God of the prophets adopted people into his family and became a spiritual father to them. The God of Muhammad is a father to no one and hates adoption. He abolished it. So they're not the same God. You can say you worship one God. And I worship one God, but it doesn't mean we're worshiping the same God. If someone comes and says, I worship Zeus, the one God, does that mean he's worshiping my God? So that's a fallacy. Secondly, we looked at the evidence and we saw clearly from, from the data, the Holy Spirit is sent by God. In fact, I can give you another reference, Isaiah 45, 16. Yahweh God has sent me and His Spirit. Yahweh God has sent me. No one's going to deny that the person sent is distinct from God. And His Spirit. So He sent both me and the Spirit. Just like the person sent by God is listening, so is the Spirit. But at the same time, at the same time, the evidence was quite clear that the Spirit is a person who has all the attributes of God. He could create. He gives life. He sustains. He regenerates. He involves a group of people at the same time, showing His omnipresent. In fact, David in the psalm, Psalm 139 verse 7 says, Where can I flee from your spirit? Nowhere. Wherever I go, your spirit is there. So quite clear 
is the testimony that the Holy Spirit is personally distinct from God, has the same nature as God, and can do whatever God does. We also looked at other evidence. We examined the angel of Yahweh. Let me repeat, by angel, I do not mean he's a created messenger. The word angel does mean messenger, but not every messenger in the Old Testament or even the New Testament is a spirit being. Many messengers were humans. For example, Malachi. Go back and read the Hebrew. Malachi comes to the word angel, my angel. But that was a human angel, a human messenger. And in light of the evidence, this specific messenger of God, this angel of Yahweh, wasn't a creature like Gabriel or Michael. He was a messenger distinct from God who happens to be God. How do we know that? God says, my name is in him. What does it mean for someone to bear the name of God? Well, in Hebrew thought, and you can check this out. You can read any commentary he wants. When you speak of a person's name, you're speaking of their character, their nature, their authority. For God to say, my name is in this angel that I'm sending, that means that angel is divine. And the context proves that's the meaning. Because then he says, or right before that he says, he will not forgive your rebellion. But according to the same Old Testament, Micah 7, 18, 19, only God forgives sins. Who is a God like you who forgives sins? No one, but the angel can. Why? Is he a second God? God forbid. We're not polytheists. We are monotheists, but we're not Unitarians. We are Trinitarian monotheists. Why? Because the evidence of the Old and New Testaments forces us to that conclusion. Neither the prophets of the Old Testament nor the apostles of Jesus Christ in the New Testament were Muslims, and they did not worship the God revealed in the Quran. And with that said, I just want to praise the God and Father of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ again, and I bear witness there is no God but the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I bear witness that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the Father, who died for the sins of His people and rose victorious, and sits enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords, and He's coming again to be worshipped by all the saints. That's the true confession that saves. Any other confession will damn you to hell. Amen. Jesus is Lord. For the Thank you guys again for coming and Sam, I really appreciate uh, your kind word. It is a pleasure as, as always. Um, a few points that I did want to make um, is that, you know, I, I, I am not an authority on the Hebrew Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. And it would be much more interesting, I think, to see a debate between Sam or any other Christian apologist and a Jewish rabbi or scholar. I think I would be definitely interested. So that's what, so that's what rabbi and scholar can particularly deal with, with the verses that Sam brought up today. Um, and with all the, with, with also that said, was, uh, you know, Sam said that he's a, that he is a monotheist, he's a Trinitarian monotheist. How we view that is that that is a monopolytheism. So when I said you believe in one God, there is still a polytheistic aspect of your monotheism. Uh, but um, what I wanted to also emphasize was that Jews believe in one God, Muslims believe in one God, that this is some type of uh, similarity that we have. He brought up my mentioning it in, in previous uh, debates as well. What I was specifically alluding to was the fact that Jews are Unitarians and Muslims are Unitarians as well. That not just monotheists, but Unitarian monotheists. Um, with that said, I think I've emphasized and re-emphasized my points continuously. And that being that no Jewish people have ever defined God or worshipped God or prayed to God as a triune being. There is no historical or archaeological evidence to prove that this was the case. You say, Sam says that you have the Old Testament, but you do not have any documentation that this was the, that this was the case. Um, and, with, and how I want to uh, finish my conclusion is uh, uh, the moderator, he, he gave an introduction to Sam Shun about how he was uh, faced with many uh, challenges to Christianity. One thing that uh, I think that wasn't mentioned in his introduction, I would like to mention it, if Sam's okay with it. Yes. Okay. Yes. That was, security, no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, well, he was born and, and raised into a Christian home, but at one point in his life he decided to convert to Islam. And he remained a Muslim for four years. No, not four. Four? How many? No, I, I embraced the nation of Islam. Who was a member of the Nation of Islam that 
influenced me to believe in Islam. This is why I'm sharing because you consider that heretical. Uh, so you never believed in Ahmed bin Jamaa? Uh, no, because I didn't know I was ignorant. The person who introduced it to me was a member of the Nation of Islam who said Louis Farrakhan was the Messiah and that Allah became a white man. So is that Islam? No, not at all. So then you wouldn't recognize me as a Muslim? No, not at all. I would agree with that. <laughs> but what I, was, what, what I was about to allude to was that if he did embrace any form of Islam, and I don't believe that that is a form of Islam, that perhaps so he monotheism, Unitarianism, had inflicted his heart. Unfortunately, he says it didn't. But I always do pray that it does.